Hello, and welcome to the Desert Island Investor Podcast, Episode 3. Mark is just tying up the raft in the lagoon because he's been away from the island for a few days, but I know that today he wants to talk a little about funds, and in particular his favourite fund, Fundsmith. Now, Fundsmith offer two funds, their flagship product being the Fundsmith Equity Fund. This provides the choice of an accumulation investment, which reinvests any dividends to boost the value of your holding, or an income investment, which pays dividends into an ISA account or your bank. There's also a a sustainable equity fund, which is built on the same model, but excludes sectors such as aerospace and defence, casinos, mining and tobacco, etc. The key to a successful fund is having a fund manager that can see into the future, and the man with the crystal ball at Fundsmith is founder and CEO Terry Smith. Terry is a best-selling author and a regular media commentator on investment issues. He's also been referred to as the English Warren Buffett. So, to tell us more about Fundsmith and to hopefully explain where he's been, here's Mark. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, Paul. So, where have you been? Uh, Well, I've not been to one Fundsmith meeting, but two. Uh, Being in Manchester and London. So, uh, sorry I couldn't take you with me, Paul, but so those uh, lobster pots weren't going to repair themselves, were they? Do Fundsmith have two AGMs each year? No, they just have one AGM or annual shareholder meeting that takes place uh, every year at, in, in London, generally at Central Westminster Hall. Uh, but it's a, an annual shareholder meeting. It's not a general meeting. But what preceded that by a week was a new initiative from Fundsmith, which was a one of a number of regional seminars. And uh, this was um, this is an, an, an added service. It was nice to meet. Uh, Neil Allardyce, he's the private client director for Fundsmith, and uh, he he was explaining this uh, an added services for for people who are direct investors in Fundsmith. So, and it certainly wasn't a hard sell. Uh, it was a seminar that was broken down into two parts. Uh, the first being capital gains tax, which I learnt one or two things there, and the second one was a fund update. So, and it was well supported, and I think they'll do more of these, and they sought feedback uh, for what we will be interested in in future what kind of subjects they can cover to to help us. So, um, again, it's it's another thing that sets Fundsmith apart from their competitors. I understand from my research that funds are an easy way to add diversity to your personal portfolio alongside your individual stock picks, but you're an experienced investor, Mark. Why did you pick a fund? I think one thing that Fundsmith offers me is, is a spread of risk. Uh, they've got uh, investments that are a little bit wider than mine geographically and in expertise, and they've got competence in areas that I certainly have got competence. So, and they understand these businesses. And I think a little bit, it's a hedge against me. If I lose the plot, if I, if I'm off beam, then, you know, all my eggs aren't in one basket with my, with my broker, with me. And uh, I think that helps me sleep peacefully at night. Fundsmith is a global large cap fund uh, with investments split over, is it five countries? Yeah, it's very much US centric from the latest fact sheet. You know, that counts for nearly 67% of the fund. Uh, France is behind that 11.5%. Denmark, 9.8%, which will mainly be Novo or Nordisk, I would think. Um, the UK, just the UK, just 4%, 4.2%, and Spain, 2.8%. So, yeah, you know, a little bit of, well, significant exposure outside of the UK, which is where I do my fishing. And what business sectors does it cover? Well, they're categorised into the following consumer staples, healthcare, technology, consumer discretionary, communication services and industrials. Now, these are very broad areas, uh, but, you know, they've got to to put them under some kind of umbrella. But basically, those are the sectors that their investments are held. Gunsmith actually represents quite a large portion of your overall portfolio, doesn't it? Yeah, naturally, it varies from day to day with each valuations of you know how my portfolio is doing and and my my pension that's in trackers. But it's currently about forty percent of my portfolio, so it's a significant interest, and it's worth me keeping a close eye on how it performs. And when did you first invest? Right. Well, that was back in April 2014, uh, when the price was 164.64. 
Um, the fund was launched in, in 2010 at just a pound, but now it's uh, 605.51. So you can see that performance, Paul, since 2014, it's you know, you know, know nearly three or four times it's grown. So it, that's probably why it's taking up a larger amount of my portfolio. So uh, it's done very well indeed. So apart from the price, what attracted you to this fund compared to others? I think the track record of what Fundsmith have, have been able to do um, over, you know, what's over two decades. Now, if you look at Terry, Terry Smith's um, track record, uh, you know, we say, you know, past performance is no guarantee of the future, but it's the best that we've got. You know, we, it, when we look to interview somebody or something like that, we're seeing what and are, are you're looking for centre forward, you know, <laughs> how many goals have you scored previously? So that's, that's the best we've got to go on. Um, and if you look at, you know, just look, you, you can see how he's done over the long term with, with Funsmith. Um, that's on the fact sheet. Excellent performance. But prior to that, he was managing the Tullet pre bond pension scheme. And he took that over in 2003 when it had assets of 60.2 million, liabilities of 90.7 million, and a deficit of 30.5 million. We fast forward 10 years to 2013, and the assets were 228.4 million. Liability is 160.4 million and a surplus of 60.8 million. So if you look over the, over the long term, his performance works. His, his, you know, his, his system, it works. Since Fundsmith was launched, the average return has been 15.6%. So yeah, you have the track record of Tullet Prebon together with Fundsmith. That's two decades. You know, we're not looking over three months or six months or 12 months. On top of that, there's clear communication. The philosophy and the strategy is spelt out to people together with the expectations. And it's in a language that I can understand. There's no jargon, Paul. So that's that's ticking all the boxes for me. Do you any of your existing holdings overlap with Fundsmith? Yeah, just one, which is which is Unilever, which Terry has been critical of in recent times uh, for communication on um, some of the the acquisitions that they've made. He's been they've, he's been very critical of those, and I think they're on the the watch list at the moment. And that is just something that I consider uh, when I in the portfolio because I had when I look at its size in my portfolio, I am conscious that that Fundsmith hold it as well. So that is just something I calculate in. But that's the that's the only stop where we duplicate. A lot of fund managers do a lot of trading within their funds, but that's something that Fundsmith try to avoid, and I believe that's even part of their motto. Yeah, for for those that have uh, followed Terry very very closely, we're familiar with this um, three step approach, which we never tire of. Um, it, the first one is only invest in good companies. Two, try not to overpay. And three, do nothing. And uh, you know, we're, us experienced uh, shareholders, we're we're mouthing the words as he's coming out with those. It's almost like a, a Nuremberg rally for um, for experienced long term investors. I've obviously been googling this, and I came across a few people who were saying that Fundsmith had gone off the boil lately. Now, do you agree with that observation? No, I don't. I think one th thing that Terry has been spelling out, even when he's performing the, the market over the long term, is that there will be times when he underperforms. You know, you just can't do it year in, year out. And if you look over a, a narrow period of time, like a year, you know, any year goes by, there's always some kind of hot subject, hot, hot, hot area for investment. And, and, you know, 2022, it was energy in which Fundsmith aren't invested in. So, you know, if you want to look at something over... Over over twelve months, you know, three hundred and sixty five days. Then, um, then you can do so. But I'm looking at a track record. I'm not bothered about the the performance rail over the twelve months. I'm looking at that that fifteen point six percent since inception. That's you know that's that's over the long term. I think we should stop looking at things over three hundred sixty five days, Paul. Perhaps when we we move to Mars, we'll, we'll be doing things over six hundred eighty seven days, uh, just because the Earth ro rotates around the sun. Uh, you know, in that period of time, I don't think that is really the, the way that we should uh, assess our investments. I did also hear some accusations that the fund is moving increasingly into the tech centre, uh, but um, the move to do that is a little too late. Uh, does this concern you? Again, not really. Um, when I mentioned earlier on about those broad subject categories, 
you know, tech is another one whereby things, you know, a lot of companies get grouped together. Um, I mean, tech is a phrase that's been around since the 17th century and or technology. So our understanding of it changes a great deal. Now, you know, some of the businesses that are classified under tech, they're payment processing, airline reservations, accounting services, something like that. You know, are they really tech businesses? And, you know, also, you know, tech, what we classify as tech is currently 20.7% versus 23.2%, which it was in 2014. I think it's just because it's, it's underperformed this year or last year that the fund and I, I think people are looking to, it's the tall poppy syndrome, looking to have a bit of a hit and, and, and where can we point the finger? Uh, in his annual letter, you know, Terry pointed out that, you know, some of the stocks that have been discussing, you know, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Adobe and Meta, those combined just made up just 9% of the portfolio. So it's not a massive shift. Uh, and as he said at the annual shareholder meeting, if we didn't have any exposure to tech, he'd be facing a lot of criticism. The Manchester meeting was a, a regional event and the ASM in London um, was like a, a, a more conventional uh, meeting that you would go to with a fund. Uh, did you find value in attending it again this year? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I'm never tired of hearing Terry's philosophy, uh, not only about the fund, but how I can try and ad 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 adapt his thoughts and his principles into the way that I run my own portfolio. Uh, it was also very good to um, do some networking with other shareholders, and uh, you know, meet some of the um, meet some of the Fundsmith personnel. So it, it, you know, I, I thought it was a a, a very good uh, a very good well two very good events. Did you meet Terry this time? No, I didn't meet up with Terry, but I met up with several other members of the the Fundsmith team uh, prior to. Uh, the meeting, I met up with a, an, another investor called Jack, uh, who's a pharmacist. We met in the Westminster Arms, and we started off by having a, a good conversation with one of the analysts, Daniel Washburn, who's based out in, in Mauritius. And we had a, a good conversation, obviously, with you know Jack's insight as well into some of these things like uh, obesity, diabetes, dementia, and uh, haemophilia, which was an uplifting uh, conversation. A lot of these are about like, the demographics of, of an aging population. And um, then uh, also met with Greville Ward, who's one of the senior partners, and uh, also had a really nice conversation with Julian Robbins, who's, um, who's Terry's number two. He's head of research. And there was actually a little, uh, <laughs> it was quite amusing during the, uh, during the, um, the presentation, uh, which is chaired by uh, Ian King of, of Sky News. He always does a, a terrific job, but uh, Julian and uh, and Terry uh, field questions, which are they're, they're submitted in advance, but uh, you know they obviously they, so they can get come back with uh, full answers. But you know they're not all friendly questions. You know some of them can be quite quite demanding. But um, Terry passed said, "Well, I let, let Julian answer this one," and uh, he, he handed him his laser pen, um, and uh, Julian started talking into this instead of uh, pointing it to the chart. So uh, that was quite humorous. And I, I, I did think to myself at that time, how many billions is this man managing for us? You know, but it was a, so it, it, it had a little bit of a chuckle. So that was good. And uh, also met up with uh, ex-Sky News business editor, Jeff Randall, who I've uh, met before. And um, we had a, a good sp uh, conversation on the recent uh, Northern Ireland protocol. It was a con conversation we carried on from like three or four years ago on Brexit. Uh, but he made a closing speech, which was very, very complimentary uh, about about Fundsmith. He's 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 ceasing as a non-executive director, and there's no. It was explained that there's no school drugery there. It's just that he he had a bit of a swipe at the FCA and uh, just a bit fed up by the the onerous rules that are are out there. And um, it's very, very difficult for non-execs. It's an increasingly difficult task. And I'm just reading in the FT this morning that it, Arm. Uh, or um, said the very same thing that the FCA onerous rules are making them float in the US. It's a contributory factor for them floating in the US as opposed to the UK. So I would suggest that we need to be in the UK a little bit more business friendly, Paul. But for a bit of clarity, an ASM and not an AGM, uh, and what, what's the difference? 
Well, there's no legal requirement to hold a, a general, a, a, a shareholder meeting. It's again an added service, something that you know Thumbsmith don't have to do. It's an extra expense, but they feel it's important to communicate with the their direct shareholders. Um, and we don't get a vote, you know, but we can submit questions. So um, that's the difference. It, it's an annual shareholder meeting as opposed to an annual general meeting. We, we, you know, we can't vote anybody on or off. Is it just a presentation or do you get a, a Q&A session as well? Yeah, well, questions are submitted at a, in advance. You can submit one, one question each. So, um, you know, the, the Ian King himself goes through those and he may or may not select your question. But um, as I've said, they're not always friendly questions. You know, they'll, they'll pick some difficult ones, some demanding ones. But they are they do have the opportunity to, you know, to go through these and, and they'll, they'll put up some supporting uh, literature as well in case of, of the argument. You know, it's um, so. Uh, you know, but the thing is, if, if your question is not answered, you always get a, an email back in writing. So, again, it's just good that the fact that they go that extra yard. And were there any particularly interesting questions or points raised this year? Well, a number of the questions were, you know, familiar territory. Um, that I suppose for people that you know, I've heard the answers before about the, things like the size of the fund and what have you. But you know, the, the theme was on the back of you know, what a lot of other people pushing up, pushing or one of the themes was um, on the tech. This is what they're calling this drift to tech, and uh, Terry seemed to bat this away quite quite well quite effectively you know he pointed out about you know, i mean the question one of the questions was about which stock in the your portfolio offers the most compelling value and he seemed to think it was meta uh and you know he did point out you know for all the criticism that they've had um they've actually shown a modest profit on meta it's not as though it's it's been tanking for them so you know that that was on meta and on apple which is another one he's been told he's been you know late to late to the game uh, it was pointed out that the actual services element is growing year on year, and that's become an, an increasing part of the business. So you know the revenues are increasing, and the actual it's not just they're just focusing on the on the hardware side. So you know this business is is slightly changing, and they like those recurring revenues. And then there was a question about um, you know is there something outside of the of the portfolio that that you're looking at that you're keen on and. They brought up a company called Adyen, which was a new one to me. Again, th this is what I said earlier on about they look at businesses that I don't understand and I I, I, I don't really have any kind of um, insight to. And they're a Dutch uh, payment billing business. And they brought up a, a lot of data about um, its revenues and how attractive it is. And it's, it looks like an excellent business, but it's on a P of 60. So, um, you know, that's a bit too rich for them. But as they said, you know, they, they can monitor businesses for years and they just uh, wait for some kind of slip, you know, some kind of opportunity. And, and then that's their chance to, to strike like a cobra. Um, I did find the, um, uh, it wasn't a question, but they pointed out about the, the, the cash conversion levels are dropped on historic, historic level, compared to historic levels. Um, but, uh, you know, I've seen that with stocks in my own portfolio where cash levels have gone down as people have been you know, building up inventory. We've seemed to be going from, you know, just in time to just in case, which is a little phrase that I've pinched there from Terry. And, he, and he's absolutely right. You know, people are uh, working a little bit more to longer lead time. So that's why those historic cash levels are going down. And then there was, you know, comments and questions on uh, demographics and uh, looking at businesses like uh, hearing devices and corrective vision. So these are all the the areas that they're looking at with, um, you know, demographics of people around the world becoming slightly more affluent, slightly fatter and slightly older. For me, there's quite enough sunshine here on the island, but uh, I know that you like wintering in Mauritius. I understand that Terry Smith actually lives in Mauritius. Is there a risk of him becoming detached from his job with the fund? No, I think there's a lot of preoccupation with uh, Terry being in um, in Mauritius. It seems to be every comment, you know, any article, it's it's always that you know Mauritius based Terry Smith, and um, it's not as though he's like Howard Hughes or some kind of James Bond villain in in his lair. Uh, he's you know he's very very accessible. It's not he, he travels over to to the UK. He travels around the world, and you know if 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 COVID has taught us anything, it's that you know. With, with the power of Zoom or, or, or whatever 
communicate similar communication device there is it's it's a lot easier to, to do business remotely so i've i've no problems with him being out there he's been out there for a number of years and the, and the fun seems to have done okay so you know there's terry he's out in Mauritius and his wider team daniel i mentioned earlier on and greville and then um, you know julian's based out in connecticut so you know they're, they're they're around the globe and it's it's not something that that, that bothers me I, I, I mean we're talking about it now but i i think they should just drop it really keep uh, talking about mauritius who can blame him it's a lovely part of the world yeah okay so all good news uh, about Fundsmith. If our listeners want to take a closer look at that fund, they can go to the website at uh, www.fundsmith.co.uk. How much does it cost to buy into the fund? I understand that uh, you can invest a lump sum of a, a thousand pounds, or if you sign up, it's a hundred pounds a month, uh, and you'll get you can opt into email alerts. Plus, they, I believe they have an app. Now, I believe that Terry buys T-Class shares, which are level low, so there's no percentage-based commissions on purchases or sales. So all you pay is a management fee. The Fundsmith fee is 1%, but that applies whether the fund is doing well or not. Is is that a reasonable amount to charge? In Terry's case, yes. I think you're paying for that track record. Um, when you look at that long-term performance, again, since inception, 15.6%. I'm certainly happy with the one percent and the you know the, the the added extras that I that I get from Fundsmith. I think given tra- Terry's track record of you know going back to inception, fifteen point six percent, you've got to pay for quality, Paul, and that track record is second to none, and that's something I'm I'm certainly we're prepared to pay. Terry's invested in T class, so he's interested in line with me on. You know, some funds charge performance fees too, but. Fundsmith don't uh, another bonus yeah this is something that terry is um rightly very very critical of uh, performance fees basically what they work is if if i invest in a fund and it loses money it loses money and if it makes money then they get a performance fee so uh it doesn't really stack up that so he's uh i i would suggest that you know people avoid funds where there's a performance fee I mentioned a couple of um, of the offerings uh, at the beginning in, in my intro while you were parking the raft, uh, but there's a third uh, fund that uh, that Fundsmith offer as well, isn't there? Yes, Paul. That's the Smithson Fund. Uh, basically, what that what that does or what it what it offers is uh, when you you know you look at the Fundsmith main equity fund. And that's valued at 22.8 billion over 27 holdings. What that means, because it is so very large, is that so there's some smaller companies that are very good companies that are very liquid. So it would be problematic to have those those into the private equity fund. So there's a second fund called Smithson, which is an investment trust, and that looks at smaller business. Let's call them smaller business. So smaller businesses. But when you look at the the median size of those businesses there's still 6.8 billion so they're still big businesses but relative to fundsmith you know, it would be di- difficult dealing in them and uh, some household names for the uk that are in that fund are people like right move and domino's pizzas and halma so that's another option that people may or may not look, want to look at smithson looking at the footprints that you've left in the sand walking up the beach does remind me that when I was looking into this, um, I found that Fundsmith had a another fund called the Fundsmith Emerging Equities Trust, or FEET. What happened to that? Uh, FEET was, uh, it, it wound up, I think that they found that it wasn't working for them. It was a question that was raised at the annual shareholder meeting. And I think, you know, one of the criticisms was the currency problem. You know, the, the cr- currencies weren't as hard in a lot of the countries they're looking to develop. So I think they've got enough to, to concentrate on with the the, the equity fund and, uh, and Smithson. Right, well, it's time for our regular 
question in a bottle spot. Let's see what's in the bottle today. It's a question from Matt Ellis, and he asks, Mark, how did you get started investing? And what advice would you give to people who are starting to invest today? Thanks, Matt. Uh, turning to friend of the podcast, Matt Ellis. Thank you. Well, the answer is, where did it start? Uh, was 148 Olive Lane in Darwin. There's no blue plaque over the house, uh, but that was the, the property of my maternal grandparents. And it was, goes back to when I was still at school. And rather than have a school dinners, I would go to my grandparents and uh, have, have a proper meal instead of what the school had to offer. And um, whilst I was there, you know, I would read the, the newspaper, which was the Daily Express, which was a slightly better newspaper back then, certainly on the, on the, um, on the financial side. But, you know, I was always very interested in sport and I'd start at the back of the newspaper reading on sport. Then I worked my way into the paper again, into the into the business pages and found it, you know, very, very interesting. It captivated my interest. And, you know, when it was by the time it was time to go back to school, um, I'd never got any further into into the newspaper. And, uh, you know, those, those probably those things were in my thoughts as I was walking back. And that interest that I had in in the stock market, you know, was 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 greater than you know, on any of the subjects that I had at school. There's no, there's nothing really that seemed to like tap into that. We didn't like, do business studies back then or economics. Probably the the two nearest subjects that were have been of help, you know, history and mathematics. You know, you know, history. What you know, what's gone before and what could happen again, and you know, mathematics. You know, you know, I'm just, I'm just that I'm the number the numbers work. So there I was as a, as a teenager, uh, without any kind of means of of investing had no funds or anything like that with with a with this, this peculiar interest in, in the stock market but we go forward a couple of years you know, I start working and when i reached the age of 18 so i had some some money coming in but that was when the government floated bt and um you know that was a time whereby it was open to the public and it was advertised in in newspapers and how differently things were back then because you you know just cut out the applicant fill it in the application form and cut it out and then post it together with a check i mean do you remember do you remember checks paul you know this is how, how things have, have changed and that was like an introduction that was a gateway into me uh, investing so uh it, it all it all started back then as a as a teenager first investments at 18 and then you know i was i was up and running that was me what would I do today if I was starting off? Um, I probably wouldn't start with individual shares, but I'd start. I'd, you know, we mentioned Fundsmith early on. I would start with a fund because if you were unlucky, and you know, say so you you pick out your first share, by virtue of being your, you know probably your only share, all your eggs are going to be in that what you know all your commitments into one stock, and if that tanks, you could be wiped out overnight. So, one of the benefits of having a fund or um, perhaps going down the tracker route is that you've got a spread that is where i would start and then over time you can expand into into individual businesses so i go down the fund route or down the um the the indexing route and um you know that should keep you in good stead if you're doing that if you invest on a, a regular monthly basis you know you're not buying at the peaks and the troughs and um, you know, but the main thing I would say, you know, about starting, just start. That's the, that's the thing. You know, it, it really is. A, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't started back at eighteen. And if you are young, then you've got a great opportunity because you've got a lot of time for that money to compound. I mean, a lot of young people, I guess, are probably a little bit more excited about the idea of trading than than the long term investments. But you do need to start young, don't you, if you're wanting to actually. Uh, you know, sort of cashing on this uh, in, in later life. Yeah, it, it's it, you know, it's never too late. But the, 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 about the compounding, when I when I look ab by, you know, ab about how I've I've performed, it's not the it's not the selections that I've made in you know the last ten five years and, and the larger amounts. It's the, it is those smaller amounts that I made, in, you know, in in the early days, and that's when it it, it counts the most. That's when you can do the most the most damage is um 
And, you know, if somebody said, you know, what is the best de investment decision that you made? It wasn't whether to buy this stock or that stock or whatever. The best decision I made was just to start, just to start full stop. I mean, a lot, a lot of the, I mean, I'm, obviously I'm not, I'm not an investor, but I mean, a lot of the apps and um, and software that uh, youngsters are using, they do tend to make it look a little bit like a, a computer game. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that's a, a definite tactic to try and draw people into on the trading side, not you know, day traders, not not so much the long term investments. Mm. But I mean, you can lose a lot of money if you're not careful, I guess. Yeah, I mean, when you go back, you know, going back to when I, I, I started uh, and it wasn't as easy to get in and get out, like I said, you to, you to post that check off. So that perhaps was a, a good thing that it wasn't convenient to, to, to over trade. Now it's just a click of a mouse, isn't it? So that is, mm. you know, perhaps that discipline that I learned early on of because it was inconvenient, perhaps that st stayed with me. You know, perhaps that's something that's molded, you know, where I am now. If, if I'd have been starting off now, could I become more? active than, than what I am before I'd learned that kind of personality straight, perhaps. But I, I would always try and think about holding back on, on trading too much. That is, it's, it's a real peril is over trading. And th these companies want you trading because you're, 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 every time you're doing a trade, you're, you, you're racking up commissions and stamp duty and uh, spread. I read a, one of the applications gives a, a notice when you uh, purchase some stock. Uh, and it was really enthusiastic, saying, "Well done! You know, you've made a great achievement. You know, you've burst, you've you've bought your first stock, and it's it's a fantastic milestone." And and it was really over complimentary as a, to doing something that basically involved them spending money, not mm. not actually making any money. Yeah. So I should imagine that that's probably a common theme uh, with a lot of these um, trading applications. Yeah. And in general, not everybody's the same, you know, younger people are more impulsive, aren't they? They're after more instant gratification. So I, I, that's something we learn generally as we get older. We, we learn to be a little bit more patient. Mm. And that's what it's about with, with, with long term, isn't it? You, it must be frustrating to, to sit there slowly making money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I notice you don't seem particularly frustrated by that. Well, no. I mean, going back to funds, as you can say, you know, I've, I've held that for like nine years now. It's another kind of long term investment. You know, I, I, I've, I've got a long term investment in somebody who looks in the long term. So just, just look at that. Going back to those numbers, uh, to, April 2014, 164.64, 605.51. Are we bothered what's happened over, over 12 months? Not really. Well, that's all for this episode. We hope that you enjoyed it. Please remember the content is for information only and it is not financial advice. If you would like to pop a question into a bottle for Mark, just post your question in the comments and hopefully it'll reach the island in time for the next episode. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.